we're going to switch forward to a, a, a clip we want to start with here. Thanks for the one we did before, but we're going to share a little bit of the skin up for a slightly different reason. Because Perhaps you should, um, doesn't the New Testament say if your enemy strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the left? Well, I, I think perhaps the phrase is used metaphorically. I don't think the card. I'm not so sure. I, I have thought about it a great deal, and I suspect he meant you must show courage. Be willing to take a blow, several blows, to show you will not strike back, nor will you be turned aside. And when you do that, it calls on something in human nature, something that makes his hatred for you decrease and his respect increase to you. I think Christ grasped that, and I have seen it work. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. All right, did anybody catch what the passage was that they were talking about from the, the New Testament? The enemy strikes you on the... Oh, turn the other cheek. Right, yeah, to turn the other cheek down. And the pastor, is, uh, is Charlie Andrews, is, is saying, what, what did he think that Jesus meant by that? Is it, was it, I think it was meant to be taken... Yeah. Metaphor, please. What's a metaphor? Yeah. So I'm saying, you know, it wasn't meant to be taken literally. It's a metaphor. It means something, something else, you know. Now, what's interesting is a lot of times we talk about, you know, do we read the Bible literally or not? But the, the truth is that, that we all do some of both. That, you know, a lot of times churches that talk about taking the Bible literally, when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, that's not something we take literally or other things. And, and churches who, who don't take other passages literally will take that literally. And part of what we're talking about is how do we actually read these things and, and how do we live this out? For example, um, oh, we can bring this up. Click on the next thing. This is, uh, this is from Matthew 22, right? And this is a story uh, of where Jesus is, uh, I believe he is actually in the temple. And we talked about this uh, last year, the week before, about the paying the taxes in the temple and about the coin given to Caesar when you pay Caesar's taxes. And so, these two groups come to Jesus to ask him this question. They say, tell us honestly, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Right? Now, this seems like a straightforward little question. Do we pay the government or don't we? But there's some other issues here. For instance, when you, uh, you look at the coin that Caesar would have, well, think about our coin. Huh? We have our quarters up here. What's on our quarter? We have, yeah, president. Do you remember which president? George Washington. George Washington. And then on the back there's a... Yeah, or Montana, or Illinois, or Wisconsin, or who knows, right? But yeah, it's an eagle, all right? Now, Caesar's coin would have the head of Caesar, but our coin at the bottom was it say? In God we trust, all right? You know what would say on, on the coin that they used to pay Caesar? Sort of. They actually would say, Caesar, son of God, all right? Now, if you're Jewish, do you believe that Caesar is the son of God? No. So there's this issue of, you know, is this blasphemy? And it's a big tender issue. And uh, now what, you know, but you also have the issue, well, who's paid to the government? What's, you know, this government? Of course, it's also an oppressive government. So these two groups come to Jesus to ask this question. Now what's interesting, why don't, you know, we talk about well, I know, how we read the Bible, literally or not. The question isn't just whether we pay taxes for Caesar or not. You have to read the situation that's happening. One group is very supportive of Caesar and thinks they should do this. The other group thinks this is blasphemy and thinks they, they shouldn't. But, and they come together to Jesus. You know, so why would these two groups come to Jesus together? You see, neither of them like him. They want, they, he's been taking all these other people and they're starting to follow him and so they want to get rid of him. So this is called a trap, all right? Because if Jesus says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, the one group's going to say, oh, that's blasphemy. And, and if he says, no, we don't pay taxes to Caesar, the other group's going to say, oh, he is not support Caesar, we've got to turn him in, all right? All right? So they're trying to trap him. So it says next, go ahead, next one. It says, Jesus knew they were up to no good, so he said, why are you playing these games with me? Why are you trying to trap me? He sees what's going on. Now, interesting, I want you to the word games. I'm going to keep this in mind, because I think this is part of what we're talking about, the games that we play, right? They're playing a game. They don't want to know Jesus' answer. They're trying to trap him. So, he goes on to say this. Do you have a coin? He says, let me see it. So they handed him a silver piece. Right? So he's looking at the coin. He's got it there. He says, it's engraving. Who does it look like? And whose name is on it? And whose is it? Well, they said, Caesar. And he says, well, then give Caesar what is his, and give God what is his. So what does that mean? I'm curious. Anybody, what do you think that means? Give the Caesar what is his. Caesar, son of God, give that to Caesar, and 
Pay your taxes, because we made the effort. Pay your taxes, man. Well, that's stupid. We gotta do that. We gotta do that stuff, right? Now, here's what's interesting in this is, you know, part of what Jesus is doing is he's saying, y'all need to use your brains and think about this, all right? Now, so what belongs to Caesar? Anybody? We got silver, taxes. We said, right? Well, anything else? Well, if we start with that, yeah. But let's put the second question apart. What What is God's? Everything is God. So if everything is God's, what is Caesar's? Nothing is Caesar's. All right? So now, so Jesus, you know, he's making them think. He's trying to get angry. And look, it's not about trapping me. And you need to think to yourself, really, what is the central issue here? And if everything is God's, then nothing is Caesar's. So what is Caesar's role? The rest of that. I mean, basically, at best, what the government's role is, yeah? Go ahead. Sure. So does that mean they're not supposed to pay anything to Caesar then? Well, that's a good question, man. Right? That's a good question. It's all God's money. That's uh, what I'm thinking. Well, that's, why that's, that's a good that's question, isn't it? Many people, they <laughs> Basically, though, saying if, if Caesar owns nothing, the government doesn't own anything, at best the role of government is what, what Jesus said they would call a steward. Do we know what a steward is? Yeah, it's, in our day we would use the word manager, right? If you own a business, you can't run everything, so you hire a manager, right? What happens if the manager does things that doesn't fit with the way you think things should be run? Yeah, you, you fire them, right? Yeah. And yeah, do they get to treat everything like it's their own? No, they're, they're just responsible. So at best, Caesar's role is, is the manager, right, of what is God's. Now the hard thing is, is the church, this has been a, a central resting point, and in just a second I'm going to carry over to what we've been talking about with the Sermon on the Mount. But this came up early in the church. Um, this guy named Justin, Called Justin Martyr, and, you know, and and in the early church, the first 300 years, there was this tension because the church was kind of this this or this group on the edge. It, it, you know, for one thing, the whole Caesar is God. Um, part of the way the government operated was you could worship any god you wanted, but you had to offer a pinch of offering to Caesar. It's an act of worship to show that you are a good citizen. Now, is is a Christian though? Who was Lord? Jesus is Lord. We never think about this, but this is actually a very political statement because the, the government says Caesar is Lord, he's in charge of everything, and you have to at least offer him a pitch to say he is Lord, then you can worship whoever you want. But as Christians have said, no, who's in charge? Jesus is really in charge, right? It's a great video by Rob Bell called You, and you, know, you can check it out on the table where he talks more in depth about this. So Christians, it was a real tension point. So Justin Martyr is, is doing what's called an apologetic, right? He's trying to... to, to deal with this issue and talk to Caesar and say why you know that the Christians are, are good folks. And he lifts up the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about how do we practice the way we live as God's people. And he says, look at how we do this. And what's really interesting is for the first 300 years of the church, this was a central piece of the church, was the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus really addresses that. How do we live our lives in this world and here and now? And it deals with everything from, from political realm to sexuality um, to our relationships and you know how we pray, you, you name it. Right? And so Justin Martin listens up and says, look, we should do this and, and, and look, it makes them really good citizens. And then he lifts up this passage. And he does something that, that uh, really made it very difficult for the church, I think, for the rest, uh, most of the rest of, of history up until our point in time. He basically does what later Luther does too, and, and Luther's been trying to deal with this for a long time and saying, you know, we need a different way of thinking about it. He does kind of what he calls a two kingdoms thing. He says, look, this is Caesar's realm, this is God's realm, all right? So we're, for this Sermon on the Mount, we're living this like God is calling us to. But we understand that you're in charge here, and so God has called us to live as, as we're you know, under you here. Right? So what we just said about who owns it all, God, Justin Martyr, kind of, in some ways, he, he creates what we call a dualism. Right? Here we act this way, here we act this way. So God enters the spiritual realm, and the rest of life is Caesar's. Now, we still do this a lot today because people talk about, you know, science and things like that. So you know, you've got to prove this to me. And so, our God's just about the faith realm, right? And, and it's really made it kind of difficult it's because it's, it's been created the separation. Since that time, the, the church has really hardly at all looked at the whole Sermon on the Mount thing. In fact, most of the life of Jesus has not really been central. In fact, if you look, 
right after this time when, when uh, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, we wrote these creeds that were said what we believe, right? And I'm, some of you may have been taught them as kids, right, growing up, you know. And I'm going to bring one up here. Go ahead, let's click on uh, one more. There we go. This is called the Apostles' Creed. It says that I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. It's God created everything. Then we get to the Jesus part. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. How many of you say this along with me right now? Because you have it memorized, right? He descended to the dead, or into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. All right. When we talk about Jesus, what is this telling us about Jesus? It's saying, well, he's God, and he came down and was born to Mary, who's a virgin, and then what? Born to the Virgin Mary, he died. suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. Where's Jesus' life? There's nothing about it. It's a spiritual realm. It's a God who comes down so he can die and save us all and take us to heaven. All right? It's just a spiritual realm. It's the hereafter, right? Now, um, click on the next one. One of the authors in this book you're looking at was saying, you know, we miss things like he was baptized by John the Baptist. He, put, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He came to preach uh, like, either, sorry, the kingdom of God to the poor. He came to heal the sick. To receive those who've been cast out, to revive Israel for the salvation of the nations, and to have mercy upon all people. So why don't we skip all that? Because that's in the real world around where Jesus is in charge. Right? So we don't deal with that. And you see this throughout the history of the church. In fact, when you come to the time of Luther, and, and you know, some months ago we were talking about Luther a lot, there's a lot of really powerful things that Luther did. But if you've actually seen the movie, there's there's a part that's kind of confusing. And I think there's a reason it's confusing, not because of how the movie was made, but because Luther was kind of confused on this issue. Right, Luther was talking about how, you know, we, the, the way the church had set up things, it was pushing people down. You know, so people, if you pay money for your, um, uh, help me, what are those things called again? My mind is all The piece of paper that gets you out of hell for free. You know, isn't this terrible? My brain just goes, all right? What is it? No, no, they're, uh, Indulgence. indulgence, thank you, indulgence, right? You get out of, out, of, out, of, you know, out of purgatory for so many years or whatnot. In the movie, we're talking to show how you know, people were poor were really being used by this. And so Martin Luther, in many ways, was standing up with the people who were on the low end. Well, the thing is, the people on the low end, when they saw this, said, you know what, we're tired of being pushed down. And so they, they rebelled against the government, right? And they always, it was called the Peasants' Rebellion. So Luther... He, he, he was faced with difficulty because 100 years before, a guy named John Huss had done the same thing that Luther had done. And you know what they did to John Huss? Yeah, I know. They burned him at the stake. You know why they burned him at the stake? It's because he didn't have anyone in the government that was supporting him to keep him from burning him at the stake. See, Luther had the German princes who were on his side, especially Prince Frederick. And so if he had supported the peasants, he would have lost Frederick's support, and that would have been the end of Luther. So Luther goes back to this Justin Martyr thing of the two kingdoms of this is the area of princes and kings, and this is God's area. And so you're not supposed to do this, right? You're not supposed to question why you're down here at the bottom. And it made it very difficult. Now, not you know, necessarily you know, saying that you know, people should rise up with swords and, and, and kill folks, but it was raising up the issue of the, the oppression of these folks. And, and for a long time we've been wrestling with this. How do we deal with this issue of these this two kingdoms that, you know, that they put out here? Now, go ahead and click 